So Jesus says, I must work the works of him, God, who sent me while it is day. Now, this is, seems like an odd response. It was one of those trigger moments that the, it should have dawned on the disciples that uh, he's not going to be with us long. I mean, Jesus dropped little Easter eggs like this all throughout his ministry. And then later on, just bluntly told them because they clearly weren't getting the Easter eggs. If you've ever watched Marvel movies, you always or even a DC, you look for uh, the Easter eggs that they've laced all throughout the movie to get hints or tips of what may be coming next. But the disciples were pretty clueless and they didn't get it. Um, so Jesus said, this is an opportunity. I'm not gonna focus on the theological question that you posed. Um, right now, this is just an opportunity for me to work while I'm here. I'm, I'm the light of the world here now, but there's nights coming. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going home. I'm going to heaven. I'm, I'm not going to be with you to do these physical acts in front of you. So it was kind of an enigmatic statement that he made, but he's trying to show the difference between light and darkness. So he being the light of the world, he has to work now. He's on mission he has to work now while he's still here. Um, but soon the night is coming. Um, he knows that. And by the way, I think he healed the man. The man he, Jesus could have healed this man on any day. He could have come back the next day and healed him. But he didn't. I think he specifically just to provoke discussion, to break this stupid rule that the, the Pharisees had that had nothing to do with God's law. It was a man-made rule that you could not do any good deed or work on the Sabbath. Um, and he wanted to get rid of that. He wanted that to be, so I think he intentionally healed the man and made clay on the Sabbath, both of which were forbidden. So he's like thumbing his nose at these rules and he's saying, the light is here, the day is here. I'm going to do the works of my father who sent me while it is still light because the night is coming. And uh, go with me now to verse six and seven. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. This is really odd. It seems odd to us. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Salome meaning the word sent. So he went and washed and the man came back seeing. Now, again, seems odd to us. Uh, if you look at the context that this was written in around um, AD 5, AD 30, uh, all the way back prior to Christ coming, making ointments and salves out of mud and clay and spittle uh, was not that unusual. I know we're like, what? <laughs> Who would rub dirt in your eyes? But this for eye infections and so forth, this is just one of those things that people did. And I think there was more to it than what Jesus did. But so first of all, contextually, what he did, not that unusual. Um, I think he was trying to emphasize two things by choosing this path. Number one, I think it's a reference to Genesis where God takes the ground and the dust, the, the, the dust of the ground, and he forms humanity out of the dust of the ground, the dirt, if you will. And I think this is a, a, a reference to that. I think Jesus is a, showing a, a work of creation with dust and clay to heal and bring sight to the man who never has seen in his life. And secondly, and we've seen this uh, frequently with Jesus, um, he always changes method of healing. Why? Uh, he knows how people are. If he did something the same way every time, people would mimic that as if it's a formula. And it now, now listen to this. And the lesson to that is the power is in God, not in a method. And this is very apropos for, you know, the way people pray, the way people speak. 
Sometimes people give way too much credit to methods and to words and to delivery of those words. And suddenly the glory isn't on God, it's on the individual. No, you need to pray it this way. You need to say it this way. You need to, you need to go about your healing request in this way. And listen, if, if, the, if the Holy Spirit says sometimes you pray with just mutterings and groanings because you don't know what, he said, what to say, and God hears that, and it goes straight to the throne of God, and he hears the need, then I don't think your diction or your vocabulary or your delivery or the fervency of how you say something, um, I think that you're getting the glory and it's not God. So remember, guys, it's God always receives the glory, never the method. Okay, and Jesus is trying to emphasize that here. So he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, See that this, again, from the perspective of blind man, Jesus has taken all the initiative. First of all, Jesus came to the blind man. The blind, blind man didn't come to Jesus. Um, he couldn't come to him because he couldn't see. Even so, Jesus expected this blind man to do something as a measure of his faith. So could the blind man have gone all he did was rub dirt on my eyes. I don't know who this guy is. And he expects, he, he expects this to work. He expects, the, and he could have just blown it off. I'm not giving up my seat here at the, uh, at the temple. Uh, I got a good spot. This is where all the, all the action happens. I'm going to, I'm going to make out like a bandit. I don't want to give up this spot because then I'm going to, I'm going to miss out on my, my day's take. Well, if that was your reaction and you didn't do anything about it, then guess what? You aren't going to receive your healing. So Jesus expected this blind man to take action. Um, and the healing isn't going to take place unless the man does his part. Now, the healing was all God's and all God would receive the glory. But this was an act of faith on the man's part. Now, the water in the pool of Siloam wasn't like the earlier pool that we read about with the, uh, the uh, lame man. This water for the pool of Siloam, there was nothing special about it. If you go way back in Old Testament his, uh, history, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, did this incredible engineering feat and dug this tunnel hundreds of yards long through solid rock. It connected to a well outside the city gates. And it brought fresh water to the people inside the walls of Jerusalem. That would come in very handy if someone laid a siege against the walls of Jerusalem. And you couldn't go outside the city walls anymore to get water because you'd be killed. So this, this Hezekiah's tunnel brought water and it, and it fed this pool of Siloam. And Siloam means scent. Um, so the man went to this pool did what Jesus said, and washed. Now, notice in the text, Jesus didn't even say, go to the pool of Siloam and, be, and wash and you'll be healed. He just told the man what to do. It was implied, but he didn't tell him to actually, you're going to be healed because of this. The man just did it out of faith. So let me just, again, you could spend the entire hour talking about this alone. Here's an application for you. Just imagine being this man, blind since birth. That means when your eyes are first open, you've never seen a human being. You don't even know what a human being looks like. You can only approximate it from yourself or from touching others. You've never seen colors. You've never seen the... You don't know the difference between a sheep and a goat, a cow and a donkey. You, and, and just imagine all of a sudden you see all of it, all of it. Some of you have told me, and I'm not at that point yet, but 
you know, you let your vision go for so long and you have, I think it's um, uh, cataracts and, you know, and it's so slow, so progressively slow that you don't know that you've lost a lot of the colors in your life and, and life becomes kind of a, a series of grays and then you have cataract surgery and you take the bandage off and it's like Wizard of Oz when it went from black and white to full technicolor and Dorothy wakes up in the land of Oz. And everybody in the theater, my dad told me, when they went to see the theater, nobody had ever seen something like that. Everybody just gasped in the theater when they saw beautiful technicolor on the screen. And the, can you imagine what this man is feeling? What, what is happening? And guys, here's the application for us. Let's never forget that moment when we passed from death to life, when we passed from darkness to light. Do you remember when it happened for you? When Jesus came into your life for the very first time? Oh, we're all grizzled veterans. We've all been doing this for so long. Remember when you first got saved and what that was like. It was like you saw the world for the first time in a completely different way. Like you'd only seen the world and the people in the world in black and white. And now all of a sudden, because of Christ in your life, everything's color. You've never seen the world like you see it before, as you see it once you've accepted Jesus into your life. And, and I, I think it's almost sad. Sometimes we lose that amazement that we had when we first got saved. But I want you to remember what that was like. And that's what this blind man is, is experiencing right now. So summary, the, G, the disciples were interested in debating theology. Jesus wanted compassionate action. So when you get to heaven, is God gonna say to you statement A or statement B? Is he gonna look at Ned and say, Ned, well said, good and faithful servant. Or is he going to say to Ned, well done, good and faithful servant? I think there's a reason it's B and not A. Let's move on to verses 8 through 12. We're probably going to get near uh, a stopping point in about six minutes. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not he who sat and begged? And some said, yeah, that's him. That's him. And but others said, no, that's not him. It's just somebody who looks like him. And he says, no, I, I'm, I'm he. Uh, that's me. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes open? And he said, a man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, well, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Now, others said, he is like him. And he said, no, I am he. It, 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 this all seems too amazing to believe. A little bit of factoid. Um, you can go through for you Bible nerds and read through. Nobody has ever received uh, sight who's been born blind anywhere else in the Bible. This has never been done. This is a one-off. Um, so this man has to convince the neighbors and the people that know him that this is really him and he sees. You see, this has never been done before. The transformation in his life was so significant that many people found it hard to believe. And he says, uh, just a man named Jesus. Now at this point, he doesn't know anything about Jesus. He didn't know that Jesus was from Nazareth. He didn't know he's the Messiah. He didn't know he claimed to be God. He didn't know he was the light of the world. He didn't even know where Jesus was. He knew nothing. All he knew uh, is that Jesus was the man who healed him. You'll see Jesus. He doesn't even see Jesus till later in the story with his eyes, with his new eyes. He doesn't even see Jesus. His first dealings with Jesus was while he was still blind. And when he went to the pool of Siloam, he was still blind. 
And then when he washed his eyes is when he saw. I, so I think we can fit in 13 through 16. So when something like this, of this magnitude happens, you take them to the religious leaders to verify the miracle, right? You take them to the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. They got to see this and they got to like approve the miracle. So they brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he received a sight. And so he tells them again, he put clay in my eyes, I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man, meaning Jesus, is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others say, how can a man who is a sinner do such things, do such signs? So there's this division among the Pharisees and, and Sadducees and the scribes, the religious leaders. There's a split because how can a sinner do this incredible thing? And then, and then they're sticking to this rule. By the way, it's a man-made rule that you couldn't do anything, including helping or doing good for somebody on the Sabbath because it was considered work. Moses never told them that. That was one of the 600 and something other laws that they made up on top of the Ten Commandments. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay. So I think Jesus, like I said earlier, before the break, I think he did this on purpose. I think he healed the man on the Sabbath. He could have done it any day he liked. He wanted to challenge these petty traditions of the religious leaders. Um, and these were traditions that they had lifted up to the level of binding laws if God gave them to him, which was error. That wasn't true. So Adam Clark, one of the old timey scholars that sometimes I read for these studies, Adam Clark wrote, works of necessity and mercy never were forbidden on that day by him whose name is mercy and whose nature is love. God never forbid that. For the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Were it otherwise, the Sabbath would be rather a curse than a blessing. I love the way Adam Clark wrote that. So the religious leaders were dead wrong. And Jesus is trying to make a point, not only to them, but to the people. I made the rules, Jesus said, and you've twisted them all out of sorts. Therefore, some of the Pharisees says, well, he's not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. To them, they were already blocked mentally. Just they were bricked, I think is the word people use nowadays with electronics and electric cars. They're completely bricked. They, they are set in their ways. Their mind is made up. Nothing's going to change their mind. He's not lining up with our traditions concerning the Sabbath. Therefore, he cannot be from God. Jesus literally did a miracle that no one since the creation of time has ever done. And it didn't sway them one iota. Not one bit. They were so hung up with their prejudices. Um, they weren't basing their decision on evidence. But really, it was frankly, they were basing it on their own jealousy, on Jesus's popularity and his influence on the people. He threatened their power. So there was a division among them. And, and, and we've run across this theme many times in John chapter 9. Um, instead of uniting everyone, don't believe that. Jesus didn't come to unite everyone. He said himself he didn't. Jesus often divides people. There were those who accepted and trusted him. There were those who rejected him and reviled him. They took one of two sides regarding Jesus. They either said Jesus is a sinner because he doesn't keep the Sabbath, or no man could have done this and maybe our Sabbath law that we think is law, maybe it's wrong because nobody else can do this. So you have this massive division taking place. Um, we'll talk more about this again, but um, we noticed, um, as a matter of fact, one of the comments was how can a sinner do such a miraculous sign? This sounds very much like the discussion Nicodemus had uh, with Jesus um, at night in John chapter three that we already went over. He said to him, no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with you. So we know later on in the book of John, we'll go over this later on in the book of John, 
that many of the religious leaders at this time actually believed that Christ was in fact the Messiah. But when we see the reaction of the parents, you're gonna see what held them back from rallying to his cause. But later they would. So let's uh, go ahead and take yourselves off mute. We are at a stopping point. We will cover the rest next week and beginning of verse 17. So they continue to do the Spanish Inquisition on this healed man because they need to trap Jesus and they need to discredit the miracle because people are going to flock to Jesus if they don't and they're going to lose all their authority and power. So we will go over that next week. Let me open it up for questions or comments on what we've covered so far. Verse 16, verses 9. 1 through 16. Ned? You know, you, you hear this and you must think that much, what faith he must have had to never have had an encounter, never have seen the world as it, as it was. He said, you know, he's been blind since birth. So I, I'm just thinking, putting myself in that spot. You would think this is normal. So why should I go wash in the pool? I've never seen anything. I don't know anything. So, But then you can look at the other side and say, well, what is it going to hurt? But the real question is the faith he had to go um, and wash in the pool. I mean, that to me, I guess that's a lesson that I've learned today to say, my God, my God, what, what, a, what faith he had and to, just to go do that. And can you imagine what it was like when he did this? Maybe he had doubt. Yeah. We don't know. The story doesn't tell mm -hmm. us. But he did what Jesus said. And when he did it and washed and he could see perfectly for the first time in his life. Guys, I would challenge you that the miracle of your personal conversion is no less amazing. That's Think right. back where you were and think back to that moment. When, you're, when the scales fell off your eyes and spiritually you saw for the first time in your life, maybe you were a kid, maybe you're an adult. I remember uh, Dr. Bob, if you guys, uh, he's in heaven now, but you remember Dr. Bob? He, he, sure. he came to the Lord late in life, like in his 80s, he came to the Lord and those scales fell off and he had been religious his whole life but he didn't know Jesus Christ. And, and he just marveled. I would love to spend time with him just to hear him talk about how he sees the entire world so differently than he did before. And guys, this is exactly the picture God is providing for us in this story about the blind man being given sight. We're no different. We were spiritually blind, dark, 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 lived in darkness. And Jesus came in and Ned, when that moment happened, you could have had that same fork in the road that that blind man, well, it wouldn't hurt. What's it going to hurt to do it? Or this is stupid. This is, uh, I mean, if all I had to do is wash mud on my eyes and everybody would be doing and not go, but he had the faith to do it. And by the way, when Jesus came to you, you could have rejected him. You could have turned him away. Well, it sounds like poppycock. It sounds like a fairy tale. Why would I do something? Follow Jesus. I gave you a story in my testimony um, recently. It was brief. I mainly wanted to spend time on C.S. Lewis's conversion. But, you know, I, I knew nothing. I probably knew less than the blind man did. <laughs> and yet it was no less as real and as eye-opening as when he washed the mud from his eyes. Thank you, Ned, for that. Think of the I, sheer. Just, uh, go ahead, Lee. Think of the sheer joy that this this man had to feel when he had oh, his man. sight given to him, man. and he would naturally expect other people to be caught up in this yeah. excitement too, and and rejoice and celebrate with him, you know. And instead, look what he was met with, <laughs> and how yeah. frustrating it had to yeah. be when yeah. the Pharisees. Um, treated him in this way disbelief 
just mistrusting his statements and all the things. And I, I can't help but think when, when I got to know the Lord, I was so excited. <laughs> Sounds stupid, but I actually thought that I could convert Satan. <laughs> I was so excited about, <laughs> I said, it's just logical. I mean, this, this guy should, this guy should believe, you know, and be, and what's he got to lose? <laughs> and uh, I was so excited about telling other people that I that even thought I could, I could persuade <laughs> Satan to change. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to live in the past, but I think it's sometimes good to go back and revisit those early days of your conversion and remember the excitement and the zeal and how your eyes were first opened. Um, yeah. And, and it's good to remember that because we get older, we get full, full of aches and pains. We get cynical. We talked about grumpy old man syndrome before on this channel. Um, it's something we have to fight. Uh, all of us have to fight on a daily or even a moment by moment basis. Sometimes it's good to remember what it was like when we first got saved. And uh, uh, yes, we have more wisdom now. Yes, we have a lot more experience under our belt walking with the Lord. Those are all good things. But that zeal and enthusiasm when we first got saved, that we would think we could even convert Satan himself. There's nothing wrong with trying to go back and recapture just a little bit of that. Thank, thank you, Lee. Any other thoughts? Paul, you went off mute. So does that mean you're going to say something profound? or <laughs> I don't think so. You were talking about looking backwards and how um, you, know, you start off by saying, oh, there's going to be a story today. There's going to be a story today. And how um, when I was younger in my faith, which is when we first started getting together, I was brand new as a believer. And so I would always ask Lynn, Lynn, is this a true story or not? Because I was trying to collect the stories of God. Like I was trying to collect things that happened in other people's lives so that I could get a sense for how he works, you know. And so whenever there and even though Lynn was like, look, that's not the point. He could do any of this. But I, I, that, for me, I was still stuck in. No, I want to know what he actually did. I want to know things that actually happened so that way I can begin to understand how he works so anyway um i appreciate now that i'm i am in a different place and doesn't matter <laughs> but back then it did <laughs> by the way paul shogi was cleaning out an old cabinet and remember when i used to write stories every week for you guys yeah um and i don't know i probably had a couple of hundred stories or two or three hundred stories or something and she found them in a folder. I guess I had printed them. I'd forgotten. Oh, uh, uh, but they're they're in a folder somewhere. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Probably use it as starter starter fluid for her <laughs> fire pit. But uh, any other questions or comments before I give you a summation today? Okay. Well, I'd like to just make a comment. It seems like yes, a summation Dan. you're about to make, Glenn. I look back. And uh, it, it, it is good. Remember how far you have fallen. That's what we're mm -hmm. told. I look back. I didn't understand much, but I just simply believed. And that was God's grace on me to do that. And I also had to make a decision not to try to go to Jesus and go to God on my own terms, but go to him on his terms as Lord. Those two things, if I could look back and say that's what I've learned, that's what I've learned. And it was the most profound points, those two things. It allowed me to move forward in faith. Amen. <laughs> so, um, Dana, I heard a good phrase earlier today, a good sentence, a good prayer earlier today. It said, Lord, grant me the gift of total surrender to your will for me uh -huh. in all things. I and like I that. thought that just, yeah. I like that. Thanks for sharing, Paul. That's cool. Sure. <laughs> Paul is live from his Jeep. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Mobile Bible study. <laughs> All right. Anything else? And then I'll close this out today. I, I had one other comparison, question. Comparison to the uh, cataracts, because I had cataracts removed from my eyes about a year and a half ago. And you, like you explained, I just can't believe the difference in the uh, the brightness and the clearness of the different texture and different colors. Mm -hmm. So when you said that, you know, this sort of brings it home. I got a little bit of what this uh, man must have seen when he, his eyes were open. Yep. 
you know, there's somewhere I think it says in that trees, you know, he, he saw trees for the first time. You see mm -hmm. all this for the first time. But when you begin to see these new colors, the colors that you, I guess they had slowly faded away from you. Yep. You'd yeah. still adjust it, but they'd slowly. But when you have those cataracts removed, and once again, you can see all that. So then it takes you back to, as you said, to when you first, you know, when I first came to the Lord. Yes. All right, got four more minutes. Any other comments or questions? I have a question, but I'm not sure if it's a... I'm, I have a question that we could always say for next week. I'm not sure how you know quick it is to answer it, but it has to do with when we were talking earlier about the third and second and third generations, you know, sins being visited upon. And I guess I just struggle with understanding what that's talking about. Like on one hand, you'll see these verses that talk about that. And then on the other hand, I don't know, God's mercy and forgiveness. So I always kind of, I don't know, I wonder about this because I wrestle, I guess the reason I wrestle with it mostly is for my own sense of personal responsibility. Like, what am I doing that's, and I shouldn't think about it that way, but what am I doing that's actually having a negative effect on my own daughter and okay. I've grandchildren got, maybe? I've know? got, I'll I'll go over that next week then, Paul. Okay, sounds good. I just Thanks. I just wrote it down on my homework, but yes, I already Thank you. I studied that for this week, but um, I've got three minutes, and I don't think I have time to go over that. Yeah, good. Yeah, let's do it next time. Okay, that'll bring Paul back next week, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to I always try to come every week. So. All right. Well, uh, let me summarize a couple of things. First of all, I tried to ask you to look through the lens of the blind man. I, I asked you to look at um, all the different reactions, like his neighbors um, kind of surprise and skepticism and didn't even believe it was him and the impression that made on him that uh, you're going to see next week. The parents, uh, they were brought in and, and they didn't want to take the blame. They didn't want to take the rap because they didn't want to get excommunicated from the temple. So they only testified that he was blind, but they didn't go any further than that, that he was our son and he was born blind because they were afraid of the Jews. They're afraid of the leadership. So there was um, fear going on because of persecution. And then you showed the consistent, um, the, just the consistent um, stubbornness and prejudice of the um, of the Pharisees and their refusal to believe. Uh, so think about all this going on around. You've just received your sight. This amazing thing has happened to you, but you see the reactions of all these people. And you're and it, what it's doing is you're slowly progressing this healed man along his journey of faith. And next week we'll go through and see that come to its fruition. But each one of these reactions progress the man along in his faith so hopefully you guys enjoyed this this week we will continue with the story next week finish up chapter nine i would ask you guys to please remember to pray we had a lot of prayer requests at the beginning of this video um both bill and dot uh pray for healing of their heart situation tim for healing of cancer uh, remember John Welch, our, our former breaking bread guy that he keeps falling. We don't know what's going on with him. He has, a, uh, he has some, some kind of a problem. Please remember Linda, uh, that, that infection that she battled last year's back. Let's get rid of it. Let's ask God to remove it. Uh, let's pray that Paul would be able to travel this week to see, I believe it was his aunt, um, and be in good health for that and uh, not be sick anymore so he could do that. And uh, again, I always ask you to pray for Rachel, uh, who's in the center of my screen right now, perfectly centered. There you are, Rachel. So remember your prayers, guys. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. I have a pop-up bottle. I'll, I will see if anybody responds. I have four minutes left. I'll close this out in prayer. Lincoln, you show up on my screen as muted. I'm uh, just wondering if that's really my buddy, Lincoln. Oh, wow. from Nic Nicaragua. Nicaragua. I, I hope it is. If it is, buddy, we love you and we hope you're doing well. Um, and maybe he isn't able to get on the video portion. Sometimes his internet is challenged down there, but uh, hopefully that really is Lincoln. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll close this out.
Father God, we thank you for your insight and for the Holy Spirit teaching your word today. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Father, for the multitude of lessons that are contained in this one story. And we pray that you would apply the ones you want us to hear where we're at right now and lead us to a closer walk with you. Lead us to a um, to not always ask why, Lord, but rather what you can do with us with this situation that we're going through right now. If it's a healing, God, let us pray for the healing and give glory to you. Mm -hmm. If it's um, endurance, Lord, let us pray for endurance and give glory and grace to you, Father God, that we can walk through this challenge with faith. And I just ask, Father God, for all these needs that we went over today, lots of people who need you to intervene in their life. We ask that you would do this. Um, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this week. We will see you again next week. If uh, anybody wants the uh, a recorded version of this, it'll be on YouTube probably later tonight. And until then, we will see you guys again next Wednesday. And thank you very tonight. much. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Okay. Amen. Amen.